Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is George Litterst, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today on behalf of MTNA. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to travel to Cincinnati and participate in an ad hoc committee uh, over the weekend talking about digital initiatives for MTNA. And I'm delighted that uh, since that time, MTNA has taken a number of steps forward to uh, reconceive of the many ways in which uh, the membership can, uh, can stay in touch and that information can flow out uh, through the membership. And today is the inaugural MTNA webinar and I'm quite honored to, to be here as the presenter. And my uh, deep thanks goes especially to Marcy Lindsay and Brian Shepard, who did quite a bit of research last summer coming up with a platform uh, on which we can uh, have these webinars. And they've set things up for us today. So we're going to be talking about digital scores. I'd like to uh, introduce a couple of things here first. So I'm going to switch over to screen sharing and you'll be able to see what is on my screen. Okay, we have, first of all, uh, I wanted to announce uh, some upcoming webinars. Um, MTNA members uh, Mario Ajaro, Stella Sick, and Shanna Kirk um, have been slated for doing some webinars um, during this winter. And the first one, I believe, will be called Preparing Young Pianists for Collaborative Music Making with Technology. You might have uh, subsequent questions for me, and I invite you to contact me by email if you would like. My email address is pianobench at gmail.com. Now, MTNA and I are just getting used to this webinar platform. We will attempt to monitor comments that you might make in the chat area where you could type in questions. There are 390 people who've registered for this webinar. <laughs> and so uh, I can't say that I would be able to deal with a question from every single person. But we'll do our best to keep an eye on that as we go. Um, I'm a pianist, an MTNA member, and I'm broadcasting from Rehoboth, Massachusetts, where my studio is located. My interest in this area of digital scores got going back in the late 1980s through a set of um, interesting fortuitous circumstances. I stumbled into a company called Coda Music Software and got invited to co-author the user documentation for a forthcoming program that ended up being called Finale. And that was my introduction to what um, music notation by computer was all about. And it was kind of a crazy time. The program was extraordinarily expensive. It was $1,000. Uh, musicians were buying a computer for the first time just to run this program. And it was so processor intensive. It was slow. The computers that people bought were horribly expensive, and it was a time of frustration for many. But at the same time, it was a brown, groundbreaking era because of the many things that Finale offered. And as you all know, as teachers, probably the best way that you learn something yourself is by teaching it to others. And I had an opportunity to write a book for Coda Music Software called Inside Finale, The Art and Science of Music Notation. And that was my opportunity to really learn from a music engraver or a music publisher's point of view, what should a musical score look like? How should the layout work? Because although Finale was a very advanced program in terms of its capabilities, it was a program that um, required a lot of manual manipulation to put things on the page exactly where they belonged. So um, I don't recommend that you go out and try to find this book on eBay someplace. Uh, it would be quite irrelevant to uh, your needs today. But that was my opportunity to get familiar with this area, which of course has changed hugely in the intervening years. Back in the early days of Finale, we were using computers with these enormously deep monitors that took up an entire desk. 
And uh, now we're looking at tablets, iPads, Android type tablets, and so forth. So it's an exciting topic that I'm pleased to get into today. And I'd like to give you a little overview right from the get-go as to what we are and are not going to be doing. It would be an interesting session just to uh, go through a list of uh, many apps that can be used for score display and talk about their relative merits. I have on my iPad about 60 different applications that can show music. And as you could imagine, we would be here until at least dinner time, if not till tomorrow, uh, talking about them all <laughs> if we wanted to do that. I also could have chosen today to take one or two apps and go into them in great depth, showing you how you manipulate the score and how you might annotate it and so forth. But what I thought would be a much better thing to do would be to get into really the broader issues of what we're facing today that will help you to navigate the waters as you explore your digital options. And these options are going to be changing uh, rapidly over time. And I think if you have this broader perspective, I think you'll find it helpful. So topics we're going to cover will include why electronic scores. I mean, after all, we've been used to paper for a very long time and paper works quite well. What is the current state of electronic scores and the apps that display them and the hardware that's available for displaying them. There are a variety of different kinds of electronic scores and one of the confusing things that you may run into is that you locate an app that you think is really great for displaying scores and it will work with certain scores and then you have access to scores that you may have downloaded for free or maybe you have purchased and they're not compatible with that app and you have to use a different app. And so now you're faced with maybe using multiple apps. Well, getting a handle on the types of scores that are available will again help you to navigate that issue. Then there's the question of, okay, we understand what kinds of scores there are, where are we going to get these things? And then lastly, we do have things that we can do today that are quite compelling and for many people they are the reason to go out and buy a tablet, especially an iPad. But what's on the horizon? What can we expect um, in the very near future? So those will be the areas that we'll cover uh, in the course of this 45 minute presentation. And I'll do my best at um, different points along the way to um, try to address questions that you may have that, that come up in this session. So let's dig right in and talk about paper versus digital bits. Of course, you may even be wondering what's the word bits uh, all about. And in computer terms, the word bit just refers to a binary integer. And binary, we know, means the number two, and integers are numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. So in computer ease, a bit is either a 0 or a 1. Those are the only two numbers that computers actually understand. And it's remarkable to uh, ponder the fact that our, our intelligent phones, our computers, our tablets uh, at the core level are just counting machines that are uh, dealing with zeros and ones and processing mathematical operations. And as a result of those zeros and ones flying about in circuitry, we can end up seeing music on the screen. It's, it's really pretty remarkable. So when we live in this uh, world of bits, we have a number of advantages. We can have a, a small device that doesn't take up very much space. And so those shelves of music that uh, we have trouble finding places to store and uh, which often sort of fall off the shelf because it's just a piece of sheet music that's only a couple pages and doesn't have any rigidity to it and so forth. We're always um, dealing with kind of a cumbersome situation. And all of that library, hypothetically, could just be on one tablet that you could carry around in um, uh, a case uh, very simply. And of course, if you have music in this digital format, um, and if you don't damage your device and lose it, you're not damaging your music either. Um, the music is not going to get dog-eared. It's not going to yellow with time. 
it's going to be always there in a wonderful condition. And it'll be easy to transport in large quantities in this way. And oftentimes there are additional features that come with the apps that access these scores, uh, annotation features that we're going to look at. And uh, one of the most exciting ones, of course, is um, the ability to turn your own pages, perhaps with a wireless foot pedal, which really means that you are um, traveling with your own page turner. Now, if we compare that to what we're used to living with, with paper, uh, well, paper is familiar. We know how to deal with paper. Uh, we can easily add stickers to students' music. Though I have to tell you that I do have one uh, eight-year-old who does come in with an iPad to his lessons, and I have occasionally stuck a sticker on his iPad. Um, there are some people, and myself included, when you buy a brand new score, maybe from Henley or a reputable publisher, you open it up and you have that certain new score smell that uh, can be very attractive because you know that inside this book there is great literature just awaiting you. But of course, that, um, that smell goes away over time. It is easy to write notes uh, on paper, but we do have options for doing that on the tablet as well. Uh, some teachers have pointed out to me that, you know, paper, especially those really thick books, uh, can be great booster seats for short students, and you certainly wouldn't want to sit students on a pile of iPads. Um, but I'm not sure that that's a really compelling reason to stay with paper. But one reason that is perhaps quite compelling is that with paper, we generally have large pages. And we're used to printing on eight and a half by 11 in our own studios, but the music that we've typically purchased from publishers has been on even larger paper, nine by 12 inches. And when we switch over to something like an iPad or an Android tablet, until relatively recently, we've generally been looking at something that's much smaller but things, of course, are changing rapidly. And last week, Apple brought out the iPad Pro, which is quite large. So um, here's an, a, a picture of uh, a piece of music. This is Elfin Dance by Edvard Grieg being displayed on an iPad. And it should look fairly comfortable if you're viewing this webinar in a large size on your computer screen. One of the nice things about this is that you could just take your finger and swipe across it and turn the page. But even more exciting would be to turn that page with a wireless foot pedal. So I'll show you in just a moment how that experience actually plays out. But first, let me show you a variety of devices that can be used for turning pages. The one that's pictured here in the upper left are the wireless Bluetooth pedals from a company called AirTurn. And they've had a variety of products over the years. They're the pioneers in this area. A wonderful pianist named Hugh Sun was the founder of that company. And uh, some of you may even know him. Uh, you'll notice that the product has uh, two pedals, a left pedal and a right pedal, and they would be used for turning a page ahead or turning a page back. In the lower right corner is a competing product from a company called PageFlip, and they have um, a very similar product, a couple of different versions of it, and I have well, one of those products as well, and I have used that also. Now, there are some apps that, particularly on the iPad, that will respond to MIDI messages, and you could imagine being at a piano that has MIDI capabilities, such as a digital piano or an acoustic piano with MIDI capabilities. And if you haven't had much of a reason to use that middle pedal on your piano over the years, you could actually assign that middle pedal to be the pedal to advance the, the page forward. Uh, and I have done that as well. Now, I'm a pianist, but I didn't want to leave out other uh, musicians in this presentation. Um, on the AirTurn website, if you uh, probe it, you'll find that there are some other products that can be used to turn pages uh, using your mouth, actually. Uh, one is a presser, pressure switch, uh, which um, 
it involves putting some pressure on that little button and that object is actually in your mouth and you could turn pages with that the other is a bite switch you could um, actually bite so if you are a string player or an organist um, and your hands are occupied uh, you could do this in fact as an organist um, the um, uh, your feet are probably busy doing other things although I have seen a picture of one Allen organ electronic organ um, that was made in recent years that actually has pistons that are marked specifically for turning page ahead and page back so wireless page turning is an idea whose time has definitely come and it's one of the neat things that we can do when we're working with an iPad so why don't we go ahead and, and see what that's like I'm gonna switch over to my iPad and I've got a digital score here if I take my finger and swipe from right to left um, in this case you'd see the page really didn't turn it, it moved the score up because the score is taller than the the music is and then I swipe again and now I'm on the top of the next page well I could do that with a wireless foot pedal and I'll do that now I'm stepping on my pedal and the music moves up I step on my pedal again and it flips over to the next page this is a program called four score it's a an app that's used by many musicians it's become quite popular actually and I've now rotated my iPad and as you can see I don't have to um, push up and down the music from the upper part to the lower part um, as I swipe or use the uh, pedals to turn the pages forward or backward the entire page is turning at one time I'm going to switch over to a different app that does page turning wirelessly this is an app called next page and you'll see that you'll notice that there's a um, button at the bottom of the screen on a horizontal line I can actually drag that and it tells me what page number I would be going to I can let go and I'm on that page I could use my finger to swipe across and you see the movement take place as I do so I'll step on my wireless foot pedal and you're not seeing any um, movement on the page it's in the case of this program an immediate switch from one page to the next now the number of things to consider as you are using these programs oh I'm sorry before we um, conclude on the page turning let me go to one other app this is an app that will be coming out uh, this next month called super score and again you can um, swipe actually I've got to bring up a score here that uh, has multiple pages uh, excuse me a second while I do that uh, let's bring up the um, this Gershwin score um, I can swipe across like so I can do oh look at that a partial page turn uh, one step on the pedal turn the top part of the page the next step on the pedal turns the bottom part of the page so that's another kind of uh, page turning feature that takes place now as I said I know of at least 60 different applications out there for the iPad and there are a small number for Android devices as well the different ways that these pages can be turned are roughly similar on different apps but not all apps use every hypothetically possible function so that'll be an area that you'll want to investigate now let's switch back over to next page and talk about how to interact with the score if I take my two fingers and put them on the iPad and do a spread you'll notice that I'm magnifying the score and sure I can kind of zoom in on things but you'll notice that the score is not reformatting and that's generally what you're going to find with um, apps today that display electronic scores if you have this ability to zoom in and out it's not going to reformat things it's just basically for a momentary experience if I rotate the iPad you'll see that the music has been reoriented but it's still a tall piece of music because the um, 
orientation of the underlying score has been rigidly formatted to a uh, portrait orientation for a piece of paper. And if we were to take a quick peek over here at um, next page, uh, next page actually won't even rotate to um, landscape orientation. Uh, it insists on staying in portrait, and if you had your iPad in landscape, you'll be seeing the music sideways. So um, those are the um, kinds of experiences that you're going to have. Now, in this uh, program called Fourscore, uh, you might be wondering, well, beyond what I've just shown you, um, what can you do to um, manipulate or interact with the score? I don't see any uh, buttons or tools or anything here on the page, which in a way is kind of nice because it's a very clean score and it's a nice replacement for paper. So one of the things you need to get used to in many of these programs is the idea that the buttons that supply you with functionality may be hidden and you got to figure out well how do I bring them back up when I want them sometimes a program will just react to a tap on the screen and I've done a simple tap here and now all of a sudden some buttons are revealed at the top and there's even a page slider here that's been revealed at the bottom and I've gone to a different page those buttons have disappeared if I tap the screen again the buttons have come back. The user interface is going to be different from one program to another. Some programs will have one little button in a corner which if you tap on reveals everything else. Um, sometimes you need to do a long press or you need to do a tap specifically at the top or the bottom of the screen. Um, I've sometimes found this kind of frustrating as I have gone through and acquired different apps that there is no standard to a user interface for how you're going to show or hide these kinds of functions. But if you look in the upper right corner, now that I've got my buttons revealed, you can see there's one that's a metronome, and a lot of programs will give you a metronome you can turn on. That's very handy. Uh, the thing I want to focus on is the far right button, which is the toolbox. And it brings up a lot of different options. The critical one here for our purpose is annotations. So annotations are really pretty neat. Um, you can see in the upper left area there are some diagonal lines of different colors and thicknesses. Um, I'm going to tap on the red line and uh, I could actually um, uh, write on my score uh, if I wanted to. There's an eraser over in the upper right area. If I tap on it, it would allow me to erase on the score. So practical application, of course, might be to circle a note that I'm always getting wrong to remind myself. And if that wasn't um, noticeable enough, I might want to go and change the line thickness or the color of what I'm going to put there. And so now that I've changed that tool, I'll make another, uh, whoops, what happened here? There we go, circle. and that's going to stand out obviously very clearly. Um, if I needed to put a musical symbol in, you'll notice in the upper left corner there looks like a, um, a hard accent. Uh, I tap on that and you'll notice a palette of choices has come up and that palette can be seen in a number of different ways and um, We can scroll through the palette, select a variety of different symbols. If I want to remind myself that I need to pedal here, um, I can put that into the score uh, as well. So the way in which annotations work is going to be roughly similar from one program to another, but it is something that um, is going to involve getting used to a particular user interface because these issues are specific to one program or another. Now, I see a question come up. Um, someone has asked, um, well, what, how are we going to find these scores? So why don't we take that issue uh, next? Where do these electronic scores come from? Well, um, very often we're dealing with PDF files. 
PDF stands for uh, Portable Document Format. It's a format that was developed many years ago by Adobe. And one way you can do this with your own scores is simply to uh, scan them in. Um, and so if you've got a scanner on your computer, uh, that scanner probably comes with software that will enable you to collate pages together and save them as a single document known as a PDF. And then we're going to need to get that PDF into your device, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, there are many different places on the internet where you, from which you can download PDFs, and they are generally free, although there are increasingly places where you can buy PDFs. But if we were just to take a quick look in a web browser, um, the big site that is being used by a huge number of musicians these days is imslp.org. And it's very easy to go through and browse composers. We could go and look for Beethoven here, for example, and click on his name. And oh my goodness, look at all of these uh, scores that there are. And then there are even more that we <laughs> can go through and so forth. And when you go and, and find a score, you may find that once you get there, there are a number of different uh, editions that have been scanned and uploaded. And this particular site uh, attempts to be extremely careful about not allowing uh, scores to be uploaded if they are not in the public domain, at least somewhere in the world. And if you download the score, they try to prevent you from downloading it if it's um, not public domain in your territory. But the website is imslp.org, and it's one of many places from which you can um, acquire a score. Other kinds of um, scores that you could get. Well, if you're doing your own arranging or composing from a notation program, you can do a so-called print to PDF. And when you do that, you're going to end up with a really nice looking uh, PDF file. And PDF files are not always um, great looking. So if we were to go back to my iPad for an example, um, this is a Bergmuller uh, piece from um, Peters. Uh, but here's another scan that somebody else uh, did. And you can see that there were <laughs> some pencil marks in this and um, a lot of sort of crud that got into the scan that was never cleaned up. Uh, if we go over to this one and look through it, you can see that one looks a little bit better, but this other one over here, um, oh, it's it was kind of old yellowed pages, and when it got scanned, it turned into old yellowed pages. But that certainly won't be the case with anything that you print yourself from a music notation program. But then lastly, there are electronic purchases that you can make, and there are a number of apps out there now that have in-app purchases some of these apps are associated with a particular publisher and um, the publisher will publish in some proprietary format and the only way you're going to be able to use that app and or that file in most cases is going to be in that one app that's associated with the file but pdfs can frequently be used in a variety of different applications and I'd like to show you how we would get um, PDF scores into an app. So the typical way to do this is to bring up iTunes on your Mac or PC. And I'm now talking about the iPad specifically. Uh, I'm not an Android user, but there are a variety of apps that will show PDFs on an Android. And I think you'd go through a similar kind of a process. Um, in any case, um, you should be able to see your iPad if it is actually um, plugged into the computer. And I see that my iPad is not, so I'm going to plug it in. And an icon has popped up here that says my iPad is plugged in. I can click on it. I go to apps. And over here are all of these apps that are on my device. Well, the thing you need to be aware of with iTunes is there's another scroll bar way out to the right. And if you scroll that down, you'll get to a secondary listing of your apps that are specifically apps that have a documents folder that you can get access to. And you can literally drag, in the case of Next Page, for example, 
drag PDF files right into this window, and then they will show up on your device. Or you can click the Add button, and you can grab things from your uh, computer and add them that way. It's not going to let you organize things in terms of files, I mean, sorry, in terms of folders, but it is a way of uh, doing things. Another alternative is to get a commercial program that's not very expensive, that's available for Mac and PC called iMazing. And iMazing will actually let you probe the hard drive, um, probe your device as though it was a hard drive. And some apps would actually let you have uh, folders and folders within folders and things like that. Um, but not all apps will do that. And in some cases, uh, you just need to drag things in and you can view them there. And that's what you're seeing here in terms of four score. Uh, it's just one flat uh, organization here of files. There is a button down here uh, called copy to device. I can click on that and again, navigate my hard drive and find files that way. So learning how to manage your scores is, um, is definitely an issue. It does take some practice and different apps work, you know, similarly or a little bit differently from each other. And you've got to learn how to adapt to these things. Now, um, let's talk about what might be the ideal electronic score because uh, this might inform you as you go and evaluate different applications and try things out. And quite honestly, there's going to be no substitute for just plain trying things out and, and seeing um, uh, what you like. Um, in my view, the ideal application would be one that shows high resolution. And if you're using a modern um, um, iPad, for example, you would have something called a retina display. And that, would, of course, would be uh, high resolution. And if you were to go to the new uh, iPad Pro that Apple has released, uh, there's a picture of it here comparing to the uh, traditional iPad, 12.9 inches diagonal uh, compared to 9.7 on the regular iPad. I did a measurement today on the printable or the, yeah, the printed area of a 9 by 12 musical score, and it was around 13 inches diagonally. And so you can see the iPad Pro is about the size you'd want to have for an ideal piece of music. But um, not everybody's going to want to spend that kind of money on uh, a music display uh, device, but uh, that is one of the possibilities. And we're now taking a look at this issue of an ideal situation. Liquid formatting. Now, that's something I'm going to show you in a moment. And heretofore has not been something that's been commonly available. But if you've been reading novels on your iPad or your Android device, you may have gotten used to this idea that you can change the font size and um, to a more comfortable size. And if you make the font size larger, for example, the print becomes larger, the sentences rewrap a little differently on the screen, and you've got more pages to read. Not more words to read, but more pages because the whole book has been reformatted on the fly. Device independence is um, an important attribute. And certainly with PDFs, you do have device independence. With proprietary file formats, typically you don't. And it's going to be interesting to see where that situation goes as we move forward in time. Um, I prefer, of course, a situation that's unencumbered by the internet. I don't want to have to be logged into the internet to get my scores although I appreciate the internet for grabbing them and downloading them, certainly. Um, copy protection is an issue. Uh, with most PDFs, you can freely um, pass them around, and hopefully you don't do that unless they're public domain scores. Um, publishers are typically encumbering their files with copy protection for um, quite obvious reasons, and I won't get into the pros and cons debate on that, but it is an issue that um, we're all going to be dealing with uh, moving forward. Annotations, of course, are uh, a huge uh, benefit to using one app over another, how well you like that. Managing your scores within an app um, is another thing to consider. And we're not going to have much time today to look into different ways that some apps offer to do that. 
but imagine that you're playing in church or you're doing a wedding gig or you're just teaching a, a particular set of pieces to one student. It would be nice to have a so-called playlist or set list that would enable you to just bring up those particular pieces that you're going to need for that event one right after another without having to navigate through your whole library as you move from one piece to the next. So an important consideration. And lastly, and this is where my, um, my mind and heart resides, is the area of intelligent interactivity. And I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, work that's being uh, done in this area. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that we have a lot to be thankful for that there are companies like NoteFlight, Notion, Sibelius, Finale, Notation Composer, and many others that have created these modern programs that publishers use for creating their printable scores because the rules of music notation are enormously complex and these programs have to do a really great job but because so many of them have learned over the years how to do a great job you have even greater opportunity going forward and I'd like to explain that to you there's a new file format that has emerged for music called music XML and believe me, Music XML changes everything fundamentally. Uh, here on the left side, you see a score uh, from a computer display. And on the right side, you see an odd looking text file printout. And I'll show you uh, close up what this file actually looks like. This is a Music XML file, which is that musical score. And it looks very much like the backside of a web page actually HTML but if we were to look through this we could see that there's something here about a key signature and it says that it's major and there's something about a clef it refers to to it as being an F clef and it's on line number four and so forth um, you wouldn't necessarily want to have to read this HTML but it is possible you could learn to do so the idea behind uh, an XML file is that it's both human readable and machine readable. And a very smart guy named Michael Good, um, while we were just getting used to the 21st century, was hard at work in the early years of this century on this file change um, interchange format. And it's now up to version three, over 190 programs support it. And Michael has moved on and has become the vice president at Make Music, the company that publishes Finale. Um, in any case, uh, XML stands for an extensible markup language. I won't get too much uh, involved in that discussion today, but suffice it to say that in the development community, there is a um, kind of a singularity of efforts that is uh, emerging here in which um, the developers of uh, music notation programs are focusing on quality music XML import and export so that files can be changed, interchanged between programs and a standard of musical symbols has emerged from a company called Steinberg and the developers are all working with a big set of rules that's in a book that's about two pages, two inches thick called Behind Bars and um, everything is kind of coming together so that we have this opportunity to interchange files and to really build the next generation of electronic publications. And the nice thing here is, is that when we deal in the world of music XML, we're not just putting a picture of music up on the screen, we're actually putting up a representation of music whose underlying data has semantic meaning. That when you see a quarter note, it's not just a picture of a quarter note, the data underneath actually understands it to be a quarter note and therefore uh, there's a possibility of interacting musically. So um, why do I get into this at all? Well I've had an opportunity to um, work with um, a wonderful pianist on a program called SuperScore which I'll be um, uh, kind of winding up the session with. Uh, Frank Weinstock is a pianist and programmer uh, formerly on the faculty of the College Conservatory of the University of Cincinnati. And the uh, result of his work has been to um, create a, a type of application that takes advantage of music XML and puts it onto the screen and lets you resize it. 
and it will reformat on the fly because we're not going to be tied down at this point to a fixed um, uh, page layout of music because the underlying data is musically intelligent and the program can <coughs> um, respond to the rules of music notation and lay things out properly. And so there are a number of um, um, musicians out there that are now creating scores in this format. And I thought I would just give you one example. One of the nice things about um, a file in the SuperScore format is, is there can be embedded performance data. And here's an example of a, a teaching piece by Paul Sheftel um, called Olay that's teaching you the hand positions for the B flat major and B major chords. And this is what it um, looks and sounds like in SuperScore. And because the score is um, uh, interactive, if you were connected on a MIDI keyboard, you could be in a learning mode and play along with the accompaniment, and it would wait for you to play the right note if you didn't play it correctly. You could be in a jamming mode where you have to keep up with the existing tempo, a performing mode where it would actually uh, follow your tempo. And um, there are a number of um, um, works here that I wanted to just briefly show you in a liquid format. Um, when you're on a high resolution display, the curvature of slurs can look stunningly beautiful. Uh, there can be pedal marks, fingerings, and so forth. Uh, you've got an opportunity to go in and, and create uh, annotations, um, change how they get displayed on the screen, uh, put in uh, musical symbols to remind yourself uh, how to play a note, um, move it around, and so forth. And as the score gets reformatted, um, size-wise, these uh, symbols will uh, move around with the music, and you can show and hide them. If you wanted to annotate a score and then send your annotations out to your students who have the same score, uh, it would be possible to, uh, to do that as well. So anyway, that's something that's uh, coming out in the near future, and it represents a little bit of uh, my vision as to uh, where things are going. But there's a lot of activity in this area from um, a number of different companies. And so at this point, I would be delighted to um, look through some of the questions here. Um, and somebody's asked, uh, for example, how would you use Music XML export? Because she has a Finale Notepad. And so uh, basically what you would do is you would export your score from Finale Notepad as Music XML. And then you would get an app that displays Music XML. And using iMazing or iTunes, the way I showed you, uh, you would be able to um, import that score and, um, and display it. And depending upon the features of the um, app that you're using, uh, you would be able to do certain kinds of things with it. Um, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Uh, someone made reference to um, uh, an article on the subject that I've uh, written for the upcoming December and January AMT. And um, I hope you'll in enjoy reading that. Uh, Larissa asked the question, which music notation software do I like the best? And <laughs> um, I'm trying to stay away from um, trying to play favorites here with uh, any of these applications. I happen to be a Finale user myself simply because I've used Finale so much over the years. And at the moment, um, because I'm very much focused in my own work with Music XML, and Finale is currently exporting the best quality Music XML data, it is the program that I'm, I'm using. But uh, Finale also is one of the more challenging ones to learn how to use. And so I'm not saying that it's necessarily the best one for everybody. In fact, that's, that's really one of the things we have to, to, to think about here which is that um, 
um, what is good for one person is not always uh, the best for others. So I see a comment that uh, went by that I've uh, gone too fast. I apologize if that ended up being the case for uh, some of you. Um, my thinking here was to give you a um, kind of a broad sense of what the, uh, the issues are here so that you can um, um, make some good decisions as you uh, explore uh, what's going on uh, out here in the, uh, the world of electronic uh, displays. Um, it's a confusing world in the sense that things are changing really rapidly. And it would be nice to say, well, you know, the best app is this one, and this is where you're going to get it from, and the best scores are found over here, and this is the place where you're going to get them, and now put them together, and, and now you just have a one-time job to learn how to use this one program. <laughs> and it isn't really uh, like that. But the good thing is, is that uh, probably everybody here who's attending the webinar is a teacher, and we're all capable of... Uh, digging in and, and learning because we're, we're experts in that area. Um, so, um, in any case, um, let's see, there's one question that came up here. Um, all right, um, let me just move over here to uh, another area of the screen. There have been a couple of requests. Uh, we are at the end of our official time here with the presentation, but I will stay on here for a bit and um, uh, answer questions. And I see a couple people have uh, literally raised their hands and we're going to attempt to let you speak here uh, into the group and, and ask your questions. So um, I'm going to see if I do this right and call on uh, Geraldine. Are you there? Hopefully on Geraldine's screen, there was something that came up, giving her an opportunity to speak. Uh, let's switch over to uh, Mary, who had a hand up. Is Mary still there? If uh, any of you would like to ask a question verbally, uh, there is a button in the upper right corner of your screen that is a request to speak, and you're um, welcome to uh, click on it. And I will see that request here on my screen, and uh, we'll be able to um, enable you as a um, verbal participant. Well, I'll just take a... Um, a uh, quick look here at um, the last list. Um, oh, I see a hand has gone up. Larissa is back. Larissa, I think you've got the floor. Unfortunately, your audio must not be uh, working. Um, okay, well, um, if there are subsequent questions um, about which you would like to uh, contact me, oh, do we have someone on the microphone? Uh, subsequently, my address is pianobench at gmail.com, and I will be delighted to... Um, to hear from you. I, I hope you've uh, enjoyed the presentation, and if you're going to be at the National MTNA Conference uh, in March, I'll look forward to seeing you there. If you're going to be at TMTA in Texas uh, later in the spring, uh, maybe I'll see you there as well. It's been a pleasure to, um, to meet with you today, and thank you for your time. <laughs>